I am Brian Oxman, and you are listening to Insight. Retired Air Force Colonel Lee Ellis is the author of Leading with Honor Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. He was held captive in Vietnam for five and a half years during the Vietnam War with great American heroes there. And he is chiming in on the Bergdahl affair. It's got a lot of Americans up in arms. Colonel Ellis, what an honor to have you on the program. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Brian. Good to be with you. There seems to be a a lot of things going on related to the military and POWs and all that these days. It is a difficult situation. In war, it has always been pretty tough to deal with the fact that you have the, the men who we honor, who we love, they are in harm's way, they are captured. It is heartbreaking, but this Bergdahl situation has got a lot of people upset. Why, why is that? Well, I think it's, uh, it's pulling on a lot of our emotional uh, values, you might say, our, our principles and our values, and our, therefore our emotions, in that we want every American to come home and be, be brought home. We don't want anybody left behind. That's one principle. Another principle is uh, we have concerns about our national security and uh, releasing five uh, uh, of the toughest of the al-Qaeda guys is a concern for some people. And then uh, I think the issue of uh, the way the trade took place without with more than 50 people in the White House, I think it is, knowing about it, but Congress didn't. So there's another issue. So there are a lot of issues going on. If you focus just on the POW issue, I think uh, certainly as a family, as a father, uh, you always want to reach out and help your kids. You want to see them back home. You want to see them rescued from bad situations, regardless of what they've done. So I certainly feel for the family. For the military, uh, we have to have accountability, and I think that will be coming. I think the Army... Uh, I think the situation has changed a little bit, and it's changing. The dynamics are just due to the American public's input into this, and I think the Army will be forced to have some accountability at least. Uh, I expect the Department of Defense to try to not do that, but I think the, the, the American people will demand accountability. I, I think and, you have a, a big point there. And yeah. President Obama has justified this by saying, look, every time we end a conflict or wind down a, a uh, action such as we are doing in Afghanistan, there is always a traditional exchange of prisoners. And he says that's all this was. Do you, do you see it that way? Is that what this was, or was it something more involved? Well, um, I think you just look at it from the man on the street or the woman on the street's perspective. Uh, most people would probably say that wasn't quite what this looked like. Uh, you can interpret it however you want to, but I think most people would say this didn't seem to be that. It wasn't set up as that. It was actually explained as his health was failing, and now his health seems to be better than we thought. So now uh, there are other reasons, I guess, why this took place. But... Uh, I don't think people see that as uh, as the winding down the end of the war. We hadn't been told the end of the war was here yet, so that's a little bit, bit of a surprise to me also. It is an absolute surprise to a lot of Americans. And what this amounts to is that you mentioned there were some 50, 60 members of the administration who were aware of this. It was something like uh, 80 or 90 percent of the people who are involved in the administration's activities involving the Afghan conflict were aware, but nobody in Congress was aware, and the law requires that they be notified. I think that's really at the heart of the upset here. Why was no one in Congress notified as to what was happening? Well, I don't know. I can't assign motives. I don't. I, I learned a few years ago. I was pretty good at assigning motives, but I learned that that's probably not a good thing to do. But <laughs> Congress can't can't hold many secrets, can it? Right. Well, logically, when you look at it, uh, well, the White House. Uh, there's no administration that's ever been hold been able to hold secrets much better than Congress, uh, unless they really, really want to hold a secret. Then they can hold one fairly well. But generally speaking. Uh, you don't see um, not much difference in their ability to hold secrets, I wouldn't think. So that leads me to think, okay, there was there was to wonder if there wasn't an ulterior motive for not telling Congress ahead of time. 
it, it raises the question, at least, you know, they could have brought key leaders in that they could have trusted. And, you know, those people have been trustworthy in the past from both sides, and they could have had those, you would think. I, I think that you got a major point there. You are listening to retired Air Force Colonel Lee Ellis. He is the author of Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton, that famous prison camp in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, here on Insight with Brian Oxman. And, Colonel, you got to go and visit the Hanoi Hilton. And, and actually, I guess the, there is a real Hanoi Hilton now in Vietnam. Tell us about your visit to going back to where you were held captive. Yeah, well, I uh, somehow between my team and uh, the, the Hilton hotel chain, they worked out it would be nice for me to go back and have a really good experience with the Hilton Hanoi uh, before I went to the old, quote, Hanoi Hilton. It's really Hualo Prison, an old French prison that the Vietnamese used for century, for almost a century. And so we started out by having a wonderful lunch at the Hilton Hanoi Opera House, which is about two or three blocks from the Hualo Prison, which we dubbed Hanoi Hilton in our right. dark humor because right. it was the opposite the opposite of what the real Hilton was. And you, your feelings on going back, it, it's got to be a, a moving experience, an emotional experience. What, what kind of feelings did it leave you with going back to the place that, that was so difficult to spend five and a half years in prison? Well, first of all, I was curious. When, but when I got there, the first thing we did was encounter uh, a Vietnamese uh, bureaucrat from the communist government, and he had some rules. And one of them uh, was that we couldn't take in a, a professional video camera. So we had to argue about that for about 20 minutes because <laughs> our trip had been, had been cleared uh, the week prior. Isn't but they didn't something. tell us about this part, and we had to have a written letter. And so this was a, a high-level negotiation, which we lost. They were very stubborn about that, obviously fearful. We got in there and uh, went around through it. And the way it's depicted now is all of the bad things prison life that was taken that had taken place in that prison was all the French treating them badly and I don't deny that that happened it probably did but on the other hand uh, because most of that was you know prior to 1950 on the other hand uh, when you get to the section where they talk about American POWs it's all propaganda of how wonderful we were treated and they do have some real photos that were taken like a couple of times a year we got a nice meal or a decent meal and uh, they have pictures of guy picking up guys picking up a tray with part of the propaganda like, food. it was part Twice of the propaganda wasn't it it's the way it was depicted as this is the way we treated these guys we were wonderful and it was just pure propaganda a photo op and what would happen is the uh, photographer would just pop out around the corner and take a picture before we could you know, do anything. You've got to stand there with a plate of food that he got on a holiday. Wow. You know, there's something I wanted to ask you about. There have been death threats against uh, Bo Bergdahl's family, and th that bothers me. I don't like me that too. one solitary bit. I don't care whether anybody likes what happened here or they don't like what happened here. This was a United States soldier, and the idea of threatening his family has really bothered me. Well, what's your thoughts on that? Well, it bothers me, too. It just shows you we have a lot of crazies in this country today. I think people have been don't have enough to do, and they've watched too many Hollywood movies, and so uh, they try to get attention. You know, the way you become famous in the world today is not by doing hard work in this country. It's much quicker just to go do something to make yourself famous, even if it's bad. And that's what a lot of people want to do. They want to make a name for themselves because they haven't done anything, and so you get this kind of stuff. It's sick. It, it, it really is. And I want to tell you something, Colonel Ellis. I, I have interviewed a couple of, of folks who are, were prison mates with yours, Orson uh, Swindell, yeah. one of the nicest guys, one, a, a great American. I think that the guys who were at the Hanoi Hilton in that time have turned out to be, you know, American heroes, just, just the kind of guy that you are and the kind of people who you were with. i, I got to tell you something. I am so honored to be able to talk to you and, and have you on the show. Well, thank you, Brian. You know, we love freedom and we love responsibility. We, we, uh, we, our goal was to return with honor, and now our goal is to live with honor and to do be good citizens, and that's, that's what we do every day. Doggone, you are absolutely right, and I am just thrilled to talk to you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. 
It has been. You are listening to retired Air Force Colonel Lee Ellis. He is the author of Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton, which he, in which he was held for five and a half years during the...